So NewsGuard uh, rates media companies based on their ostensible reliability, and that has the effect of driving advertiser revenue away from them if they're ranked unreliable. All of the sites that they ranked reliable were liberal, including you know websites such as the Huffington Post, and all of the ones that they deemed unreliable were conservatives. If this entire disinformation, counter-disinformation so-called ecosystem existed in and of itself, without any sort of government backing, I think we'd probably still find it objectionable, but we'd say there's a First Amendment right to it, it's protected. The problem here is that government is conferring its blessing on this entire ecosystem, which clearly exists to chill speech officials don't like. There is certainly um, a perception that if you lean a certain way, that if you have populist impulses, that somehow you're not considered brand safe. Is, is uh, Ms. Sheffield wrong in what she just said? I'm not entirely clear what point was being made there. Okay. Silencing something. and censoring means something. No, and, and there's, These and websites have not they have disappeared. Speech. They that's have what not we've had, and that's fined. what the schools they have, have not had. been imprisoned. When a news guard comes to you with the rating that it does, it does so with the backing of one of its largest investors, which is a major ad PR company representing major major clients, including the likes of, for example, Pfizer, pharmaceutical companies, and it does so with advisors that include the former head of the State Department's Global Engagement Center, the former head of CIA, NSA, as well as the former Homeland Security Advisors. Okay, Ms. Franks, do you think- It's actually Dr. Miss, Franks. Miss, what's that? It's actually Dr. Franks. Okay, Dr. Franks, sorry. Yeah, you seem to have a problem paying attention to the questions being asked of you today. I'll repeat it for you again. Here with us today is Janine Eunice. Uh, Ms. Eunice is litigation counsel for the New Civil Liberties Alliance located here in Washington, D.C. Our next witness here with us today is Mr. Benjamin Weingarten. Mr. Weingarten is investigative journalist and columnist for the Real Clear Investigators and Real Clear Politics. Our next witness here with us today is Ms. Carrie Sheffield. Uh, Ms. Sheffield is a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum located here in Washington, D.C. Our final witness today is Dr. Marianne Franks. Dr. Franks is the Eugene L. and Barbara A. Bernard Professor in Intellectual Property, Technology, and Civil Rights Law at the George Washington University Law School. Can we, or can you tell us more about how NewsGuard operates and how they impact the ability of businesses to earn revenue? And it's why it's a problem that the federal government is giving these kind of companies money. So NewsGuard uh, rates media companies based on their ostensible reliability, and that has the effect of driving advertiser revenue away from them if they're ranked unreliable. Uh, now, I, I believe that GDI is even worse than NewsGuard, uh, and their secret blacklist was actually revealed uh, sometime before we started this litigation and was part of the reason we actually did. Um, and their secret blacklist showed that all of the sites that they ranked reliable were liberal, including you know websites such as the Huffington Post, which I would argue are not you know don't really engage in the most uh, um, journalistic practices of the highest integrity. And all of the ones that they deemed unreliable were conservative. So that really shows that this is viewpoint discrimination. Not to mention the fact that the GEC shouldn't be funding any of this at all because their mandate is to deal with foreign so-called disinformation. And this is these are domestic news sites that they're ranking. Uh, if uh, I'm a small business owner, which I actually am in Texas, and uh, looking to place advertisements to online to a conservative audience, but the advertising partner I'm working with is partnered with a company like NewsGuard, am I going to have issues reaching out to the audiences I need to reach out to? Well, so in the industry, there's a term called brand safe. And a lot of times, especially for a small startup or a medium-sized business, a lot of these big brands, like say a Nike or some of the bigger marquee brands, they aren't going to be familiar with smaller startups. And so they rely on some third parties to determine whether or not this organization or this media outlet is quote unquote brand safe. And that brand safe designation can really make or break uh, the future of a business. Uh, as I said earlier in my testimony that 40% of small and medium business publishers say that digital ad uh, sales drive over half of their overall <laughs> revenue. So this could be the death knell if they're not considered brand safe. Which narratives do you see being silenced? And do you think this is a, creating an environment where those in power are not being held accountable. I think there's substantial evidence to suggest that views, for example, with respect to virtually every aspect of COVID-19 from origins to mitigation measures, 
would lead a site to get downgraded to the extent they took positions that were antithetical to those of public health authorities. We've also seen this as well with respect to uh, the war in Ukraine. And I think what is so chilling about this ultimately is if this entire disinformation, counter disinformation, so-called ecosystem existed in and of itself without any sort of government backing, I think we'd probably still find it objectionable, but we'd say there's a First Amendment right to it. It's protected. The problem here is that government is conferring its blessing on this entire ecosystem, which clearly exists to chill speech officials don't like. Can you discuss how this investigation, the legal expenses they create and harassment they invite, can have a chilling effect on the legitimate political speech of individuals? Yes, uh, particularly through the use of things like very burdensome subpoenas, as you've mentioned, invasive record requests for massive amounts of private communications, pr work product, including uh, of student volunteers in some cases, demands for closed door interrogations of researchers, uh, very expensive lawsuits that take not only uh, money but time away from researchers um, and their important work. Uh, those who are involved in these investigations have at times lied about researchers' work, have vilified them in the press. They've made false accusations about them on social media, which has led to extensive harassment and threats by online mobs who have published their private information in some cases, have uh, expressed threats by um, individuals against their family members, and made many of these researchers fear for their safety. And in response, many of those uh, individuals have closed down their social media accounts entirely, they've canceled speaking engagements, they've withdrawn from their work, they've withdrawn from civic participation, and this is in fact what it looks like to see government coercion and actual silencing. Thank you. Can you discuss how these censorship efforts are affecting uh, you know, the, the implications for your, for your small businesses? Yes, uh, as we've heard from my colleague and also from uh, litigation from other outlets, uh, and in my personal experience, um, there, you know, whether it's investors or advertisers, there is certainly um, a perception that if you lean a certain way, that if you have populist impulses, that somehow you're not considered brand safe. So and like I, Title IX, you mentioned something about Title IX. So if I, don't, if I believe in Title IX and boys shouldn't be playing girls' sports, I could be censored. Absolutely, and in our case, we were censored by the tech platform Eventbrite, yeah. which removed our event, which allowed women to right. speak about sexual assault right. and their concerns with being forced thank, to be placed thank in. Thank you. And Ms. Frank, you think that's wrong? You asked the question of whether or not you had it right, um, if you're hearing this correct, uh, correctly, and I would say, no, you're not, if what you're I'm suggesting. I'm asking specifically, is, is uh, Ms. Sheffield wrong in what she just said? I'm not entirely clear what point was being made there. Okay, then we'll move on. But you did ask if whether or not you were hearing this correctly, and I do just want to say that no, what I was suggesting was not, in fact, my feeling about the law. This is, in fact, a statement but You were pretty law, clear. I'm going to reclaim my that time. That the First Amendment Wine actually Gun does allow the government to express its own viewpoints, but it does not, of course, allow it to silence or to censor. You cited Rehnquist, exactly. okay? Rehnquist's decision, and the draft was taking place, okay? Rehnquist's decision would not have suppressed or censored anyone online or putting up a billboard that said, I'm against the draft. You're suggesting that would be appropriate by the government, and that is dead wrong. I'm suggesting that words mean something, and the words silencing something. and censoring mean something. No, and, and there's, These and websites have not they have disappeared. Speech. They that's have what not we've had, and that's fined. what the schools have had. They have not had. been imprisoned. They and that have is not what is censored. appropriate, counter speech, diversity in ideas and discussion. Exactly what the GDI is providing, yes. Is that what the GDI is providing, Mr. Weingarten? The government has the bully pulpit and a whole slew of other tools to express its viewpoint, funding entities that exist to bankrupt media companies that propagate dissenting viewpoints expressly to me is, is un-American, unconstitutional, and frankly just wrong on its face. Uh, they labeled you all in, in pretty uh, nasty terms, label real clear, small, but it's one of the most risky and untrustworthy media outlets uh, impacted operation, which impact your operations and revenues. Want to talk about that a minute? Well, first, it bears noting that when a news guard comes to you with the rating that it does, it does so with the backing of one of its largest investors, which is a major ad PR company representing major major clients, including the likes of, for example, Pfizer, pharmaceutical companies. And it does so with advisors that include the former head of the State Department's Global Engagement Center, the former head of CIA, 
NSA, as well as the former Homeland Security Advisor. So when it does so, it's a big deal for you to be tarnished and your reputation to be attacked with very little recourse against it on seemingly subjective grounds. Right. Not by a competitor, by the government. De facto. De facto, okay. Warning labels. Uh, the, the government has said uh, that uh, uh, cigarette uh, companies have to put, tobacco companies have to put warning labels on their uh, uh, their products because it causes cancer. And this is just a yes or no question. I just, Miss Eunice, uh, do you oppose th those warning labels? No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Weingarten, do you oppose those warning labels? No. Uh, Miss uh, Sheffield, do you oppose those warning labels? Sheffield, uh, I don't think it's applicable here, but yes no. Yes or no? No. It's apples and oranges, but no. Good. Uh, Miss Franks. No, I do not oppose Okay, that. now, here we'll get to something a little bit more applicable. Uh, Ms. Sheffield? Sheffield? Sheffield, yes. Okay. Uh, like the nanny. Yeah. During the uh, 30s and 40s, uh, Hitler's Nazi government used propaganda, not just in Germany, but here in the United States, as you're aware. Uh, one of the leading causes of uh, 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 drivers of anti-Semitism and ultimately horrible events uh, including the Holocaust has been blood libel, including this lie that Jews killed Jesus. Let's say, as they did in the 30s and 40s, uh, that the Nazi government uh, uh, was paying for content on platforms uh, that uh, Jews killed Jesus and, and, and that they needed to be round up. Would you have a problem, uh, Ms. Eunice, if the government uh, pulled that content? I'm sorry, who's, who's putting the content up? Well, this was content that was put up uh, and distributed throughout uh, the United States in the 1930s and early well, 40s. And so if, if similar content was put out on a media platform now, yes or no, do you have a problem? Uh, I do not think that the government should be involved in so, censoring so they get that. To, I think the counter, counter speech is the it. appropriate way. So in this case, that's fine. Jews kill Jesus, round them up. You can keep it. Mr. Weingarten. Well, I'd want to think more about the hypothetical. You, you want to think more. That's an apt to, to this is you're talking about foreign funded on domestic platforms. Correct. We don't we're also talking about an enemy regime, not American speech on issues that are politically. Foreign protected. adversaries don't pay for this uh, by saying, hey, we're paying for this. We don't know uh, who's paying for the content. Um, Ms. Sheffield, yes or no? You're, you, are you okay with this or no? This hearing is about the Global Engagement Center, which is Ms. the U.S. Franks, State Department and whether or not they spent U.S. tax dollars to Ms. suppress Franks, American I'm assuming, citizens. I'm assuming you, you, would totally be, you, would, you, would, you would agree that that content needed to be removed. I believe that if the government made the choice that it wanted to assist organizations in countering that message or suggesting that there were tools that could be used so that that message could be countered with truthful and factual information, that that would be acceptable. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, Ms. Sheffield, your beef is with uh, Eventbrite. I mean, you're, 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 you're frustrated because Eventbrite... Uh, thought that uh, uh, promoting an event that uh, bullied children was a problem. That's how they saw it. It's a private company. Uh, did you take them to court? We requested them to reinstate our event, and they chose not to respond. But again, that's just one of numerous. And then, did you take examples. them to court? Um, we, we've waited. We've sent out a, a message to them. We waited for a response. The event has already passed. Um, but again, this the question. But you really could, if you wanted to, you you have access to the, the the criminal justice system, the court system. You could take them to court. We could. Okay. And and in fact, we actually are taking the Biden administration to court for its illegal rewrite of Title IX. So just be careful, because the Supreme Court just said I wouldn't do that. Thank actually, you, and I yield back. The Supreme Court just said that they this was not based on Gentlemen, standing. Yield back. Time Not is on up. Substance. I now recognize Representative Van Dyne from the great state of Texas for her five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Landsman just quoted from today's um, SCOTUS opinion, but it's important to highlight exactly what you were saying, that neither the individual nor the state plaintiffs have established Article 3, which is standing. This means that they did not have standing to sue. This is not a decision based on the merits. Ms. Youngest, would, you are a constitutional attorney. Can you give us some clarity on this? Sure. Actually, I'm uh, one of the lawyers on the case, so I know it well. Uh, this was also limited to the preliminary injunction. They said because a preliminary injunction is about forward-looking relief and they hadn't, the plaintiffs hadn't established a likelihood that they would be harmed in the future because some of these programs appeared to be ending. So this is not about the merits. The court actually specifically said it was not expressing a view as to the merits. Uh, the case will continue in the, in the district court. Um, and, 
I suppose that's that's essentially the issue. Is this is limited to the preliminary injunction? Uh, they are not saying that the that the government didn't do anything wrong. Thank thank you for clarifying that. I wanted to make sure that that was clarified and not just cut off. I was stunned, Miss Franks that you had to say that, oh, they haven't been imprisoned. Is that now the bar that we're setting? So we're fine bankrupting these, these, these businesses. We're fine blacklisting them. We are fine shutting them down and silencing their voice, but at least they're not being imprisoned yet. Mr. Weingarter, do you think- Sorry, was global- that a question for me? No, it's, it's not a question. I'm just flabbergasted at your statement. Well, Mr. Weingarter, you do you think the Global statement. Disinformation Index is a fair assessment? I don't, but even if it was, the government shouldn't be funding it. So given that opinions are often difficult to separate from fact and that facts evolve over time, would it even be possible to assess the accuracy of a media outlet in a truly objective fashion? It's an inherently subjective exercise. Outlets put out news and views that are varying, and to have some sort of ministry of truth or ministries of truth out there with the government's blessing is incredibly chilling. So why is it an issue that the federal government is funding supposed fact-checking organizations? Because effectively, this amounts to a bridging of speech by proxy. Even if you couldn't draw a straight line from a government official saying, take down XYZ speech, the government is effectively giving its blessing through its funding to these entities, which exist, to put out a business, some entities, and also, by the way, effectively provide a subsidy to the protected, whitelisted publications as well. So it's a dual-edged sword. It's picking winners and losers de facto with government funding. But it's picking winners, winners and losers based on what? Well, it seems clear when you look at the breakdowns of how the scores come out based upon ideology. Viewpoint diversity is antithetical, it seems, to these entities. So Ms. Frank said that, that typically what happens is it benefits conservative news outlets. Has that been your experience? Is that what you've seen? We've seen ratings to suggest NewsGuard's ratings reviewed large samples of both right-leaning and left-leaning publications, and it comes out that the left-leaning publications rank substantially higher, 25-plus points higher on NewsGuard's 100-point scale than right-leaning publications. Can you give any examples of right-wing publications that they have um, disparaged? Uh, well, for well, <laughs> they cast, I guess, real queer politics and real queer investigations as having an undisclosed conservative bias, but... Of course, this includes uh, The Federalist, I think probably, well, The Daily Wire, Town Hall, I believe, a slew of other so-called right-leaning entities as well. Excellent. Thank you. And I yield. We're not talking about the government expressing its viewpoints. What we're really talking about is when the government pays and uses taxpayer dollars to fund these entities that we're talking about here today that actually... um, discredit some of these news sites and drives away their advertisers. Do you think that's fair as well? What is fair is for the government to be able to fund projects and organizations that do certain things with those funds that may include competing in the marketplace of ideas, and they may be winning in the marketplace of ideas, but the government is not making those choices, and when certain news outlets lose in the marketplace of ideas, they may want to blame the government for that, but maybe they're just losers. So, Okay, Ms. Franks, do you think... It's actually Dr. Miss, Franks. Miss, what's that? It's actually Dr. Franks. Okay, Dr. Franks, sorry. Miss Jonas here said that when she was looking at the, uh, these entities and the organizations that they had blacklisted, every single one of them was a conservative-leaning organization. Do you think that's fair as well? Is that okay, Dr. Franks? He was a different name, so I wasn't sure you were talking to me. Yeah, I'm still talking to you. I'm still looking at you. I'm still talking to you. Would you re- repeat the question for me? Yeah, you seem to have a problem paying attention to the questions being asked of you today. I'll repeat it for you again. Do you think that it's okay that these entities that are blacklisting companies, all of the, all of the companies on the list that are blacklisted are conservative outlets? Do I think that it is okay for a company, for a nonprofit organization to develop tools that offer rankings? In other words, offer speech of criticism, critical speech about certain businesses? Yes, I think that's okay because that is protected First Amendment activity. So you think it's okay for the federal government to be using our tax dollars to basically, through a proxy, blacklist one one side of the aisle? You think that's okay? I do not because that is not what is happening. Really? How so? Yes. Because then why are when, then why are all the why are all the companies on the list the blacklist conservative groups? 
I think that's something that conservatives would need to answer. No, I think that's something you need to answer. I've because we're talking about censorship here, and there's only yes. one group of people being censored. No one is being censored. Miss Eunice here, Miss Eunice here admitted that she's not even a Republican. She leans left. Yet she's telling us that all of the companies on the blacklist are conservative groups. How do you square that, doctor? I don't have to square that because, as I said, the focus I know, because here, you don't have to make any sense, do may you? May I answer the question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, right. The First Amendment has certain principles and certain rules. People may not like them. People may disagree with them. People may not like the fact that someone out there may say conservatives are all bad or liberals are all bad. The correct response to not liking that is to engage in your own speech, as is often happening here. It is not to say, oh, this is censorship, we're being silenced. It's simply to say, we disagree with what's being said here. Try to compete, and if you are good enough, maybe you'll win. Ms. Jonas, what do you have to say about what Dr. Franks just said? First of all, uh, I want to be clear. Can I have Microphone. I want to be clear that this wasn't just about NewsGuard and GDI. There, the government was funding hundreds, at least 300 tools and technologies that were designed to censor speech. Some of them weren't even pretending to censor foreign disinformation, quote unquote disinformation. Of course, that's a subjective term. Uh, so they were hosting COVID disinformation challenges where they were giving grants to companies who showed that they were the best at censoring COVID disinformation. COVID is not really a national security or foreign topic, even if it, you know, it has some tinges of that. So th this was about the government using its authority. The government can't use its authority, can't use its power, and can't use its money in order to censor views it doesn't like. It's the government, yes, it has its right, a right to censor sorry, to express its own views, but not to use those views to censor. That's where it stops. And the court expressly said that in Vulo recently, actually. Mr. Weingarten, I'm going to allow you to comment on this exchange. I just say briefly, we've heard a robust defense of the government's purported right to speak, which as we've established really looks like a right to censor. And the, the censors portrayed as the victims here, but American speech en masse has been censored by this censorship industrial complex on a slew of issues that expressly reflect protected political speech. And if a stop isn't put to it, we're going to lose this right in toto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, do you find it ironic that the Biden administration uh, pointed the finger at uh, states like my state, the free state of Florida, for removing porn, pornographic materials from elementary schools, yet they actually went to Amazon to have these books secretly removed. Do you find honor, uh, irony in that, Ms. Sheffield? Oh, I absolutely. I mean, it, it's, but, but it's also not surprising from this administration that we see um, over and over the overreach of government to suppress uh, speech. Um, it, and it's interesting, this congressman brought let, up when- uh, Let's just do this. I've got more questions to get to. Let sure. the reflector, uh, let the record reflect uh, the witness says, yes, it's very ironic. Uh, here's how they did it too. America, are you still listening? Because they use something called NewsGuard uh, and then they get to pick and choose what sources, what news, if you if you like them, they, uh, they'll they promote you. And if the they don't like you through NewsGuard, then they can bankrupt you, they can label you disinformation, and it's, it's shocking, it should be shocking to you, America. So we are talking about foreign-facing foreign facing agencies, easy for me to say, uh, that are supposed to be giving ratings to disinformation coming from other nations, correct? That's correct. And now they're using those authorities to do what? They're using those authorities effectively to tr attempt to cripple the business models of disfavored media companies, so, US-based media companies included. So we're not really talking about government speech and what is and isn't allowed. We're talking about these specific agencies have authorities and they're acting outside of those authorities. Am I understanding that correctly? That, that's how I see it. And not to speak, but to suppress others' speech. Before I'm done, give each of you three a chance. Is there anything you wanted to say today that no one's asked you the right question to get you to say? The First Amendment says that the government shall, shall not abridge the freedom of speech, abridge. So the government should not be using its power to censor ideas, whether it's through co coercion, collusion, any of those means. Uh, I think that's the most important principle um, that I want to put forth. I agree. That's also how they taught it in my law school. Uh, it's, it's notable that in the opinion that came down today, there's a footnote in the majority's opinion which says, because we do not reach the merits, we express no view as to whether the Fifth Circuit correctly articulated the standard for when the government transforms private conduct into state action. So it is not a ruling on the merits, 
But the court's silence on the merits, I think, speaks to the imperative for legislative action to be taken because the courts are not necessarily going to provide a panacea on this issue. Yeah. Ms. Sheffield? Yes. Being from Utah, great to connect with you. My ancestors helped found Salt Lake City. Um, Wonderful. So I mentioned earlier in my remarks about the, I think, staggering uh, ratio of eight to one when we're talking about State Department employees donating to Democrats by an eight to one margin versus Republicans. To me, this begs the question, to what extent is the unelected bureaucracy of the you know, Politburo of the State Department and other government agencies, to what extent do these unelected bureaucrats shape what happens in terms of these, these funds and government taxpayer money for projects like the University of Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab, the Moonshot CVE, the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensics Research Labs? Who elected these bureaucrats at the State Department and other agencies to take my tax dollars, your tax dollars, the people, my, my cousins and uncles in Utah, their tax dollars to fund these suppressive activities? I think. I don't know if you're allowed to question me, but the answer is nobody likes me. <laughs> and, and I'm going to just cut you off so I can use the rest of my time to point out, since you brought up Salt Lake City, that it was settled by people who were running from the government telling them they couldn't exercise their First Amendment rights. So this isn't the first time this has happened. It is important, and, and having this hearing is bedrock important to what we do as Americans. Can you please explain the legal basis upon which your clients brought the case against the State Department and its Global Engagement Center? There are three main claims. First of all, it's a First Amendment violation because by funding uh, and working with the Global Disinformation Index, which is a effectively blacklisting conservative uh, news sites or disfavored news sites, uh, the government is interfering in the uh, marketplace of ideas and effectively censoring our clients. Uh, it, there is, you know, it has to go through a couple of uh, levels. You have to, it, there's a, you know, you have, it's not direct. It's um, through these mechanisms. And that's what makes it kind of insidious and has been allowing them to get away with it. It's also a problem because the GEC is supposed to be fighting, their mandate is to fight foreign disinformation. They operate under the State Department, which is right. uh, you know about foreign affairs. They're not supposed to be uh, dealing with domestic speech. And they don't even pretend. They're, they're, for instance, there was a presentation, which you can look at online, in which um, the GEC's technology uh, and engagement representative, Alexis Frisbee, T said that they were having conversations to ensure there's discussion occurring. So I think, you know, those are in terms of interaction. That's talking about at a domestic level. They're not even pretending this is about foreign disinformation anymore. Mr. Weingarten, NewsGuard is another left-wing organization supposedly ranking disinformation in the news. Let me tell you, just because you have news in your title doesn't mean you're a news organization or you're fit to call what are balls and strikes in the news business. We have dealt with them on the Armed Services Committee. We're getting them out of the business of regulating speech. Uh, for the DOD. Uh, it doesn't only decide which source of media are, are or are not disinformation. They also have partnered with the largest teachers union in the world to teach students about disinformation. What does NewsGuard's partnership with the American Federation of Teachers, a top donor to President Biden, mean for center-right news? I think it means that the American children are going to get a left-wing or left-wing oriented diet of news content going forward to the extent the relationship persists and what's called media literacy education increasingly gets mandated in states across the country. How much of a danger are organizations like NewsGuard to the foundations and principles of America? I think they pose an existential threat. It would be illiberal for them to exist even if they weren't government funding, but the government funding makes it particularly chilling and disturbing. This is a very, very disturbing issue that we're dealing with in all realms of government right now and the committees on which we serve. Uh, this is of utmost importance because if you can get, not get information that is unfiltered and the truth to people, we are going to be brainwashed into a liberal, woke, broke ideal of what America truly is. And if there's no further business, that objection, the committee is adjourned. <laughs>